Hi there, I'm Jim Zirin. Welcome back for more conversations. Our subject today is police corruption. Almost a half century ago, the legendary five-member commission to investigate alleged police corruption in the New York City Police Department, known as the Knapp Commission, began its work under the administration of John Lindsay. Following revelations aired by Detective Frank Serpico and others that there was a blue wall of silence intended to cover it up, systematic corruption in the NYPD. What exactly was the mission of the Knapp Commission? And what did it accomplish in the two years of its existence? With us are two experts who know the story. Richard J. Condon served as New York's police commissioner in 1989 and 1990 in the Koch administration. He was on the Knapp Commission staff. Raymond W. Kelly is no stranger to us. He served as police commissioner in the Dinkins administration from 1992 to 1994, and again under Mayor Michael Bloomberg from 2002 to 2014, making him the longest serving police commissioner in history. He is now the chief executive officer of the Guardian Group, an organization providing security services to individuals, governments, and corporations worldwide. We're honored to welcome these two outstanding gentlemen to the program. So I'll start with you, Ray. April 1970, can you remember that far back? What were you doing professionally? <laughs> I was a sergeant, a newly promoted sergeant in a patrol precinct. The Knapp Commission was announced at that time. I was also going to law school, by the way, uh, as I worked on, uh, on patrol. The Knapp Commission was announced, but it didn't, that it was going to look into police corruption. But it had hearings later in the year, and that's really, they were blockbuster hearings, and it sent a shockwave throughout the department. By the way, then I was working with Jay Kriegel and Maya Lindsay, building a block security program, and actually went to Washington with them. So I had left the, I left the precinct. But uh, it, it, the, most people thought in the department that there was some corruption as far as gambling was concerned, gambling enforcement. It's just kind of stayed away from that. I think what the, the really relevant uh, part of the, uh, the that commission hearing was that narcotics was a, an area of <laughs> very strong uh, corruption. There were these meat eaters and grass eaters, as you know, the grass eaters were people who just take sort of casual uh, uh, bribes, that, that sort of thing, versus the media who were real serious people. Crooks. And they, were, they were real criminals. So all of this was a, a revelation, I think, to, to most cops. Now, Dick, how did you come to uh, have an association with the NAP Commission? Uh, I had done an investigation. <clears throat> were you in the NYPD? I was in the NYPD. I was a sergeant, and I had done an investigation into... Uh, police corruption involving plain clothes, and it was a very extensive investigation that was done by the Manhattan District Attorney's Office. And in the end, we uh, found that the Chief Inspector's uh, investigating unit, every borough plain clothes unit, and every division plain clothes unit was on a, an organized pad. And, uh, the I pad. Think, uh, the pad. So yeah. that's a list of. Uh, it's it's a list of. Money. Well, f to a large extent, it was a list of policy operations because the policy people would move around more often than the bookmakers. The bookmakers would contact it generally by phone. And then there were also other things like crap games and card games that were also uh, paying money to the police. And uh, we got about 65 indictments. But unfortunately, the wiretaps that we use under New York state law didn't comply with Title III under the federal law, and we were not allowed to use them. So all of those indictments uh, just disappeared. And there were a lot of police officers who were uh, fired as a result of the investigation that we did in the police department. But there were no, uh, none of the criminal prosecutions stood up. And how did you get from there to the Knapp Commission? I was at a meeting in the DA's office with a, uh, uh, an assistant district attorney in the rackets uh, department, and Mike Armstrong came to meet with him. And uh, I was just sort of sitting on the couch minding my own business, and Phillips started to uh, tell Armstrong that 
there was really very little corruption in the police department. This was Bill Phillips. He was no, not Bill Phillips. This was uh, Joe Phillips. This was an assistant district yes. attorney, and he told Armstrong that there was really very little corruption in the police department. And uh, then Phillips made the mistake, and he turned to me. He, he said, uh, "How many precincts are there in the city?" And I said, "78." And he said, "How many precincts have Bergman?" And I said, "78." And then I explained that that didn't mean that the commanding officer of every precinct was dishonest, but there was someone in the precinct who was picking up money in the name of the commanding officer, whether the commanding officer ever knew about it or not. And that was my introduction to Armstrong. And then eventually I was asked to go over uh, from the intelligence division of the police department to uh, help with the Knapp Commission investigation. Now, Ray, you, at the time of the formation of the Knapp Commission, uh, David Burnham wrote a series of articles in the New York Times, of which you undoubtedly were aware uh, that uh, uh, allegations of corruption and of cover-up had been brought uh, really to the mayor by uh, uh, Frank Serpico and David Dirk. So were you surprised that um, a uh, commission was appointed by Mayor Lindsay to look into the subject? Well, but this had been going back for about three years. No, I wasn't surprised. The mayor actually tried to do an internal commission. Mm -hmm. It involved the police commissioner and other government employees. That just didn't fly. The press was all over it. It wouldn't have credibility. So the mayor then had to do an external committee, and that's where Whitman Knapp uh, came in. He was the chairperson. Uh, our friend, uh, Mike Armstrong, uh, became the chief counsel, and as a result, he became a bit of a rock star. He was mm. uh, amazing. I was going, I had just finished law school, and I got my, uh, my degree, and I said, wow, who is this guy? He had that kind of smirk, <laughs> you know. Mm. He was very, very good, and uh, as I say, he, he became very famous. He was, his picture was going to be on the cover of Newsweek magazine. Unfortunately, that mm. week, uh, China was admitted to the UN, and so they pushed him off, <laughs> off the, uh, the front page. Off the cover for China. Right, yeah. The commissioners were very interesting people. I mean, Cy Vance went on to become Secretary of State. Franklin Thomas, who was a Deputy Commissioner of the Police Department, went on to head the Ford Foundation. And then the attorneys on the staff became very prominent people, too. John well, Sprizzo, Nick Capetta, uh, a fellow by the name of... Uh, uh, a fellow, Otto Obermeyer, who became the U.S. Attorney yeah. for the Southern District of New York, Paul Rooney. They're a group of very distinguished uh, people. So you actually had three uh, people who later became federal judges, uh, Whitman sure. Knapp and John Sprizzo right. and uh, Arnold Bauman, wasn't Arnold Bauman? Bauman, yes, Arnold Bauman, Bauman became a judge. Yes, too, yeah. and uh, so it was a distinguished panel. All right, so there were really two phases to the commission's operation. Uh, mm -hmm. The first involved uh, Detective Bill Phillips, who was getting payoffs from a madam, the, the happy hook. The Vandia Hollander. The Vandia uh, Hollander. Hollander. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and there were a series of, uh, of public hearings in which Phillips testified, and Mike Armstrong was the examining attorney. So what, it, what are your memories about that? Well, Phillips was very interesting because he took money any way that you could find to take money. He was shaking down... Uh, was a, was a very a Hollander. He, uh, when he had been in plain clothes, he had been uh, taking money in plain clothes. When he was a detective, he was taking money, you know, uh, on individual cases. So he, he was very familiar with the infrastructure of of, of where corruption existed in the police department. Uh, and uh, when he turned, of course, he was he was a wonderful witness because he had an awful lot of information. So he was a meat eater. He was the meat eater. Oh, he was the meat eater, yes. And this was the objective of the first phase involving Phillips to make cases against corrupt officers or really to see if there was a pervasive pattern of corruption? No, yeah, let me tell you the funniest thing about the Knapp Commission. The most important thing that they did, they never got any credit for. Uh, Nick Scapetto, who was one of the attorneys on the Knapp Commission, he turned Bob Lucy who was a detective in the Special Investigations Unit of the Narcotics Division, and that was the premier narcotics unit in the police department. And he went undercover and started working for the feds. Well, actually, what happened was that the information he had was so important that uh, the Armstrong brought Scapetta, 
and Lucy over to the U.S. Attorney's Office in the Southern District of New York, and they made Scapetta an assistant U.S. attorney, and he ran Lucy, and the Knapp Commission never mentioned Lucy. But about a year after the Knapp Commission finished, 52 of the 70 people in the SIU were indicted. Two of them committed suicide. SIU is the Special, special Investigation Unit. And they were the people who did the largest uh, narcotics operations in, in, in the city. So that was very important. And another thing, Phillips had spoken to a police officer who told him that he took $5,000 from an organized crime guy because he had seen the organized crime guy commit a murder. And they never mentioned that in the Knapp Commission. After the Knapp Commission ended, they turned that over to a prosecutor. So those were two, like, in incredible fines, and yet they never became part of the uh, of, of the you hearings. Know, uh, Mike Armstrong did a book 40 years after mm -hmm. the Knapp Commission. And if you're interested in this subject at all, you got to read the book. It's fascinating. It's really into the details. Dick knows them by heart. He knows them personally. But anybody else who am interested in this should get that, uh, get that. I think it's called uh, They Thought They Were Honest. They, they, they wish. They wish they were honest. They were honest. honest. And that was based on something that Serpico had said. Right. He yeah. said 10% of the cops are corrupt, 10% are honest, and the rest uh, right. wish they were but, honest. Yeah, honest. But, but Phillips was a terrific witness. He was a charismatic guy. I think they had him on the stand for three and, mm -hmm. and, and three and a half days. And he just handled it very well. I mean, he could have gotten his own uh, TV show if he <laughs> didn't go to jail later. Well, yeah, no sooner did he get off the witness stand than he found himself indicted for murder. Yeah, well, it actually was funny because the detective who was investigating the murder of a, uh, a customer at a uh, house of prostitution saw Phillips on TV, and it resembled the uh, <laughs> sketch that he had of, of the person they were looking for. And so he it's started the investigation. Tapes. He went in to meet with uh, John Keenan, who was a Manhattan district attorney then, and told him what he thought. And Keenan was, oh my God, you know. And uh, as it turned out, they had enough evidence and Phillips was convicted of murder. And he, he did 33 years. And, uh, you know, and, and Mike Armstrong never thought he did the murder. Never no. thought he did nope. it. So nope. Keenan and Armstrong were close friends. He used to yes. argue yep. to, to Armstrong's dying day with Armstrong I, claiming he was innocent. I spent more Keenan lunches listening guilty. to the Keenan Armstrong exchange. Mm -hmm. uh, but he was convicted. He was convicted. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, well, that was an interesting episode. Uh, so. You then have uh, uh, phase one, Phillips talking about the pattern of corruption, the culture of corruption in the police department. And then they go on to phase two, which is the uh, Serpico-Dirks affair. Now, that was already out there. Yes. Uh, Burnham had exposed it all in the New York Times. So why did the commission need to hold hearings about that? I think the pressure was on them to hold hearings on that. They didn't intend to hold hearings on Serpico and Dirk because they thought that the Serp Serpico uh, exposés had already been dealt with. In fact, I think the Bronx District Attorney at the time, Bert Roberts, I think they indicted several of the people from the division where Serpico had been working. Uh, but there was a lot of uh, pressure on them to, to have further hearings. Yeah, the question had to do ultimately with whether or not Mayor Lindsay knew about it. Mm -hmm. And that's how Jay Kriegel got along. Jay was a phenomenal person. I worked with him. He was like the deputy mayor. It's not his title, mm -hmm. but he was running a lot of things. So the issue he was, chief was of staff. in private, uh, in a private hearing, he basically said that he only told Lindsay very general information. Then in a public hearing, he, he said, no, I, I specifically told him. So there was this desire basically from the media Mm -hmm. They get more get drilled out. down information. They, they interviewed John Walsh, who was the first deputy commissioner in the police department. He had this fierce mm -hmm. anti-corruption reputation. And it appears that he did nothing about the reports from, from uh, Serpico and Dirk. So that was the, the second uh, hearing, as, as, as Dick said. There was no intention of having that, but the, the pressure was on, mm -hmm. so they had to bring sort of the political aspect into it. And the police commissioner at that time, although he really resigned at the... Uh, Leary resigned very quickly after the commission started. And uh, he uh, now, uh, was it believed he had a lot to answer for? He presided over this culture at, uh, of corruption. That, uh, and I think it's fair to say, uh, Howard Leary was a good man. 
He lived in Philadelphia. Uh, he was recruited to become a police commissioner here. Not certain he wanted the job. He, his heart was sort of in Philadelphia. <laughs> so was so he his wasn't body a hands-on guy by any means. So I, I, th I don't think he knew very much about it. And uh, maybe he didn't want to know about it. I, I, I don't know. But he, he apparently spent every weekend in Philadelphia. You know, he, he, he never really embraced the New York. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Or, first prize is one day in Philadelphia. Second prize is two days in Philadelphia, <laughs> and, and so on. But uh, so, are you critical at all? Of, you you uh, really wound up with a report, a comprehensive report, and you cited cases and instances and mm -hmm. drew conclusions. You didn't bring any cases, uh, but that really wasn't your mission. But uh, it created quite a sensation, as Reyes said. But are you critical at all of the NAP Commission? Do you think they should have done more? No, I think they they performed an important mission. I think their goal was to rub the department's nose in it. It had this problem had been rumored about, but it had been neglected by the hierarchy of, uh, of the police department. So they wanted both the department and the public to know about what was going on. They weren't looking at specific people to hold accountable. They weren't, that was mm. not, their, not their mission. And I think they accomplished their mission. You know, I mean, it, it was a subject. Is, is corruption going to be uh, evergreen in the police department always an issue? Yes, because you're... Well, there'll always be bad actors. Uh, uh, absolutely. So, you know, it's something that you always have to have to watch. But it was a it was a cold shower to for a, yeah. a lot of police officers. To I think the culture changed. I think that in the earlier years, the bad guys had the upper hand. And then after the Knapp Commission and, and the indictments that followed and things like that, it was easier to be honest. And you yeah, were yeah. more at risk if you were being corrupt yeah. than, Mike, than you had been. Mike Armstrong said that really uh, to be one of the boys, you had to be part of the culture. And, uh, if, uh, and there were even people who bragged about being corrupt, even though they hadn't done anything wrong. They hadn't done anything wrong. Because no. uh, it would be sort of a notch in their mm -hmm. belt. Mm -hmm. But uh, you, another aspect of this, uh, guys, was the relationship between uh, federal law enforcement and the NYPD. Now, at that time, uh, the time of the Knapp Commission, the uh, uh, federal government, the narcotics uh, agency, brought or alerted uh, the uh, NYPD to a number of cases involving corrupt officers, and it was ignored because it was felt that the feds wanted to lock someone up, they should lock up federal agents and not uh, New York City police officers. Now, that certainly has changed today. You yeah. Well, a lot of those cases came right out of SIU. Yeah. yeah. And, and that led, in the end, to the destruction of SIU. And, uh, Ray, did you feel the relationship with the federal government has changed over the years between the NYPD and the federal government as far as corruption is concerned? Uh, I think as far as corruption is concerned, it's always, certainly in my experience, always been a very strong relationship with, uh, certainly with the U.S. Attorney, Southern, Eastern uh, District. So I don't, I don't see much of a change. Now, maybe back then, we know that there was an issue with John Walsh, first Deputy Commissioner. There was resistance to federal cases. There certainly wouldn't be that today, and it wasn't that way on my watch. I remember there were two narcotics detectives who were indicted in the federal court named uh, Kelly and Imp. Uh, you may remember them, and uh, they divided um, drugs after a seizure with the uh, informant, and they were prosecuted in the federal court, and the NYPD was monitoring that very closely, and they had people from the Internal Affairs uh, Division. This would be in, uh, I don't know, 1970 or so. And they were both convicted, uh, but uh, it was an example of uh, a federal indictment of New York City police officers and this feeling perhaps at that time that uh, they should have cleaned their, NYPD should have cleaned its own house. Well, federal indictments of police officers are not uncommon anymore. You know, not anymore, you know. Uh, they, uh, quite often uh, that will happen. Okay, so you move on. Uh, 20 years to the early 90s, and uh, it was a time, Ray, when you were police commissioner the first time around, I guess, and uh, you have something called the Mullen Commission. Now, if the Knapp Commission accomplished a great deal, why did we need the Mullen Commission? 
Well, because you always have to monitor corrupt for corruption in the police department. When you give, as I say, yeah. people relatively yep. low pay a tremendous amount of power, you have to assume there's going to be some, some corruption. So I think the Mullen Commission also did a good job. But it was focused on narcotics trade. And Michael Dowd in particular was the target of the Mullen Commission. And what it surfaced to us, it surfaced to me, I was the first deputy commissioner and then the uh, police commission, it surfaced that we, our structure, our internal corruption fighting structure was wrong. We had uh, internal affairs division uh, handling what I would consider to be low-hanging fruit. We had something called the field invest internal affairs units in borough commands without any resources at all. And that's, that's who was investigating Michael Dowd, Sergeant Tromboli, who did a terrific job. He had no support, no support. So I became a commissioner, and I restructured uh, the Internal Affairs Division, made it a bureau. For instance, the Internal, the Internal Affairs Division commander did not report to the police commission. <laughs> no, I, I, I changed that. I want to know what was going on. Reported what, what to the on, chief inspector? On a <laughs> daily basis. No, it reported to the uh, chief of inspectional services, yes. which had the intelligence division. Mm -hmm. So it, it's got this amorphous uh, relationship. Uh, it was the Mullen Commission, by the way, praised you, as you remember, for uh, uh, yeah. really cracking down on the culture of corruption. Yeah. Well, we had to change things. Yeah. But it doesn't mean that once you have a commission, that you don't have to worry about corruption anymore. We saw the no. Seabury investigation. Yeah. It is a 20, there's something to that 20 uh, year cycle uh, phenomena. Well, uh, let's just talk for a minute about uh, the monitoring of the police department because uh, an outgrowth of the Mullen Commission was the Commission to Combat Police Corruption. Mike Armstrong uh, became its chairman uh, eventually. Uh, and uh, one of the members so, was Jim Zirin. I another member was Jim Zirin. It wasn't mm -hmm. his. And uh, <laughs> the uh, but you have uh, uh, that commission, and you have the U.S. attorneys, uh, two U.S. attorneys in New York City, and you have five district attorneys. You have an inspector general. Uh, you have uh, commission uh, of commission investigation. investigations, uh, such as he is. And uh, is that too much oversight? And of course you have the uh, uh, Civilian Complaint Review Board looking at police brutality. Now, uh, is that enough uh, oversight or is it too much oversight? Does it demoralize police officers? Well, the unions will tell you absolutely yeah, it's way too much. much. We don't need any, any of that. I think it's hard to say uh, enough is enough. You're always going to have these courts for cases. Mm -hmm. And the question will be, how did this happen with all of this oversight? It happens. And because Absolutely. a lot of that oversight is not just police oversight. I mean, the Southern District of New York, the Eastern District of New York, the five district attorneys, watching over the police is a small part of, of uh, their uh, of work. Going back to 1970, you had the, uh, the locus of most corrupt activities seemed to be in the plain clothes division, of, which was uh, responsible for uh, enforcing gambling laws and yeah. narcotics laws. Uh, and what was the salary of an, an, an officer? I, I don't know what the number was, but it was very low. I mean, it, no question about it. Yeah. Um, and it, was that uh, a rationale for corruption? Uh, probably, you know, use it as an excuse. Some cops say we're not making any money, so we have to do this. I mean, this, that's never an excuse to, to do that. But I, I, in 1971, just to show you what the conditions were like in the city, 15 New York City cops killed that year. Two in automobile accidents, 13 were shot and killed. So it mm. gives you a sense mm. of what the job uh, was like in those days. It was very intense. That may be fed as, as a rationalization too to, 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 to take money. But uh, you're right. It, it was it certainly was seen to be. Uh, located in the enforcement units as far as gambling is concerned. But the NAP Commission showed that that, that wasn't the case, that narcotics corruption was, was ongoing. Ongoing. So um, I have a question for you two gentlemen, and uh, you may have the same answer and you may have different answers. And the question is, uh, what was the legacy of the NAP Commission? Well, I, I think I would say that it shifted the balance between corrupt and, and uncorrupt. And, and 
where you were almost embarrassed, as you said earlier, to uh, admit that you're not corrupt. That, don't, that doesn't exist anymore, you know. And, and I don't think the police officers are afraid to turn in other police officers if they see something on the board. Ray, do you yeah, I, I basically agree. In his book, Michael Armstrong says that the Knapp Commission basically greatly reduced the, the grass eaters. Mm -hmm. You know, the people who were just looking for any kind of opportunity, $5, $10. Didn't do that much to the meat eaters, though. They, they think, in his book, and anyway, they're look still there. Careful. Right, exactly. They're, they're much more on guard. But uh, yeah, he changed the culture. I, I agree. Or the commission changed the culture, and I agree with, uh, with Dick. Change the culture. Sunlight is the greatest of disinfectants, said uh, Justice Brandeis. Thank mm -hmm. you so much for coming by. This has been just terrific. Pleasure. Nice and to see you. Thank, thank you, you for coming by. Tune in next week for more conversations. I'm Jim Zirin. Take care and all the best.